Back again, huh? Yeah, me too. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I'm really ready to get these finals wrapped up. So you can see I've got everything clean on the back side of the sprocket, at least clean where it counts. It's still beautiful where it needs to be. Both sprockets, I should say. So everything's prepped and ready right there. And on the bench, well, we have quite a few pieces. So we kind of have a complex ceiling system that goes on in this area in the cover here behind those drive sprockets. And just a quick rundown. So we have the old tin bellows seals. You can see I've got both of those thoroughly degreased. And well, we have some other things here. Let's just run through. You remember these round pieces of cork that went behind the bellows in the covers here. What I did was just make new ones out of eighth inch cork rubber. That's about all that we need to use to get by back there. Oh, those things still just make you black. And of course we have the dust shields with the bolts with the little points on the ends that go in the notches to locate those, keep them from spinning. And then we have the sprocket nut and the bolt on lock. And then we have, this is a, like a, it's not a thrust washer. It's like, well, it's the wear surface for the cork facing on the bellows seal. And it goes on the back side of the sprocket along with this heavy piece of cork here. You can see those were the two old ones. And again, I just cut those out of the eighth inch sheet cork. So the way this works is the cork piece goes on first and then, come on, one-handed, we're stellar today. The washer goes on over the top of that and both have the little notches that are, you know, corresponding with those pegs, keeps it from rotating. So, you know, that's what seals the bellow seal to the back of the sprocket and to the inside of the cover. Now, when I took all these pieces out of 1113, I was expecting to see wear and damage and breakage and like with so many other things on that tractor, they just weren't that bad. But in the meantime, the good folks at Florin Tractor hooked me up with two of the updated rubber style bellows seals that have the, also have the rubber um, sealing washer on the back side and a much tougher cork surface rubber bellows in the middle instead of the tin and also a couple of new old stocks still partially covered in cosmolini goodness washers for that cork surface or that sealing surface face on those bellows and wouldn't you know i got into these things and i thought you know these original tin bellows are just so cool and you know i think we can rehab these things keep it true to design so yeah we're just gonna file these things back away into the vault and update what we have right here now just a warning story time book is out the only other thing i need to address with these bellows is this cork facing that goes up against these washers so you look at this one right here on this side we're pretty darn close to metal because that's worn so far down the other side is a lot better long story short i found where this thing had been cocked a little bit sideways at one time i put more pressure on this area and that's why that wore so badly this one over here is really good it's good enough that even if i replace that i'm not going to gain anything and we're not tore up we're still soft it's not deteriorating even though some of you guys may just be trying to turn away from the monitors right now i'm not going to do anything with that cork but we need to do something here not a big deal because that cork facing is listed separately as a 3b5759 i thought i might have a couple dug in the archive sure enough 3b5759 got two of them right from cat and you know i think it's been a few years since i bought those because I called ziggler just this morning thinking i'm going to get another pair to replace those so if i ever get into, into another bellows sorry slow down man I'll have something on hand and turns out there's only <laughs> there's only one of those 3B5759s left in the United States. His computer showed Morton Cat had one, 70 some dollars and that was it. He might be able to source something from overseas and I told him for all of that I may be able to well get by with what I have. So I don't know how long it's been since I bought these. It's got a tag on it yet. Okay, yeah, um, judging by that date, this would have been when I was working on, that would have been X253, the prototype crawler. Uh, I'm gonna go off on a tangent, I can't, I can't help it. All right, follow me, if you will. 
we'll come out here into no man's land. And why would I be buying Caterpillar parts for a Minneapolis Moline? Well, this thing's been out here for a little while. It's kind of embarrassing. We're kind of turning into a, a catch-all shelf, but I think we need to move this stool. And the engine stands somewhat. Pull the cover back. And for the astute observers, you'll notice that's that's a Caterpillar D2 sprocket, the whole undercarriage on this thing. The links, the pads, the rollers, the track frames, the dirt guards, the idlers up here. Everything is Caterpillar D2 on a Minneapolis Moline. It was a heck of a thing in January of 1956. A couple of, <laughs> a couple of Minneapolis Moline employees from the R&D department went over to Ziegler and said, uh, yeah, we own a Caterpillar D2 that we own because it's our D2 and we own it. And we need the undercarriage, all of it. Not only the wearable items, but the track frames too. They're all shot. We need all that because it's our D2 and we own it. And, you know, if Cat would have known, they were buying these production pieces to put on one of their prototypes. They never would have let them within a mile of these things. But I can only imagine a couple guys in trench coats sweating profusely, <laughs> all nervous, you know, saying, oh, oh, it's not like we work for Minneapolis Moline or anything and we're surreptitiously trying to obtain these parts so that we only have to build half a prototype and you all will build the other half for us. That's ridiculous. Yeah, you know, so, yeah, she's, uh, she's still pretty. Man, when is, anyway, when's the last time I had this girl out on a date? Man, I'm trying to think. How was the Now Then show? When they featured Minneapolis Moline, that was August of 2018. That's the last time that thing has even moved. Wow, that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah, I offloaded it, washed it, parked it in the corner here, drained the gas out, threw the cover on. Thing has not moved since. Oh, some of you have asked too, where is that thing? I haven't seen it in a while. See where we are right there? Literally two feet away from where we talk all the time. So, yeah, that's why we were buying Caterpillar parts for a Minneapolis Moline because it, it shares all that stuff in common. It even has a pretty wild steering clutch and clutch drum brake setup, all D2 components that they really reworked and it's a heck of a deal. Some people know the details on that. Unfortunately, that was before my YouTube days. I don't have any of that on video, but anyway, we need to get back on track here. To nutshell it, and I know I've probably lost half of you by this point, considering we can't really get any more of these seal kits, that's why I'm only doing the one that needs it. The one that doesn't, it's going to be just fine. I'm not worried about that one bit. Now, pretty straightforward. These are just glued on. So you find your scraping tool. Warning, not a pry bar, chisel, or punch. Didn't read anything about scraper, so we're good. Let's just get in there and dislodge this old cork. Now we're cooking, we got down behind the leather backing, so coming off fast now. There we go. You can see there's these holes around the back side because that's like a double layer. We got like a leather ring on the back here and then there's cork that's laminated to that and then the leather part is glued back here. Those holes go around these pegs. That helps to keep it from spinning, so. We need to get this surface good and cleaned up. There we go. Clean and no oil, no solvent, no anything left on there. We've got the seal ready to go. So yeah, leather backing, holes punched in it to align with the pegs, cork facing. And what I used to glue it on is this black super weather strip and gasket adhesive. Does the trick every time. So, set it on there, line the first peg, and work our way around.
And this is where you want to make absolutely sure you've got this seal completely seated all the way around. Look for any high spots because the flatter you can get it now, the easier tomorrow will be. The reason I say that, okay. Good. The reason I say that, because for tonight, to let this set up, we're going to throw the washer on there and weight it down with our D3400 cylinder liner turned special service tool. We'll just leave it set like that with pressure on it, and I'll see you all tomorrow. And with that, the morning sun shines in brightly. Well, after I turned the camera off yesterday and before I went in, I decided, you know, we're gonna double the weight up on there. So I grabbed a couple of these V blocks from over by the press, just for good measure. Can't hurt, right? So I'll have a look at it. And honestly, it's looking pretty good. No visible high spots that I can see. But just to make sure, we'll come over here. You can see I wheeled the old table saw in because, well, that's this is probably the closest thing to, well, a nice smooth machined finish that I have. And quick look at the Selected Service Articles book. They have a pretty good article in here about, well, bellows seal facings, basically doing everything we've just done. And they mention how, you know, you want to check the cork for flat on a good machine surface with some sandpaper cork side down just to make sure you don't have high spots because it would take a long time to wear down natural high spots once this thing got covered in oil and you'd have a continuous seep that whole while. So that's what we're going to do here. Yep, and you see we've got a high spot there we're taking down, another high spot right there. We'll just keep going until we see fresh cork all the way around. All right, that actually flattened out pretty well. You can see I've actually got more low spot trouble right around there where it's darker and then right around there than I did high spots. But I've went in as far as I wanna go because we have enough material to still be able to seal there and there for as well as these bellows seals ever worked to begin with. All right, they've never been a 100% positive seal. And the more of this that you sand away, the more life you're taking out of the facing. So we have plenty enough contact all the way around there to call that good. And as long as I was at it, I also refreshed the surface of the old facing that I'm leaving intact. And sure enough, it had it had a few grooves that showed up in there because the corresponding washer for that, you can even kind of, you know, zing your thumb across those. That had, I think it ate some dirt and just was dirty and gritty in there and kind of scored up a little bit. So what we do with that, well, go back to the manual right here talks about the washer number one on the back side of the sprocket it can be turned over to provide a new wearing surface and these have not been used on the back side they're still new back there honestly this is one of the first d2s i've ever been into where these had not been worn on both sides anyway so that's what we're going to do flip that one over this one is still would probably be passable the way it is but we'll flip it over too since we're putting on a new facing and we're ready to assemble all right, the cork seal goes on first. I've got a pretty good amount of sealer on that flange. Two reasons. One is to help it seal. The other reason is to just kind of stick the gasket and the washer all together in here while I put it on. Because as you can see, I think from this mark here and this mark here, some kind soul, well, the last person that was in this, actually used a chisel to stake metal over the top of the washer to keep it all together. Made that really fun for me to take these all apart. There's corresponding chisel marks on the other side too. So I don't want to do that. We got some sealer on the back side of the washer. Worn side is going in. Just slide that down, engage it with the tabs. There we go. You can see where those staking marks landed just above that washer to hold it all on. I'm going to arrange a few sockets around this thing because I'm going to put the cylinder liner on top of this once again and let that 
bear down on the washer so it starts taking a set while I work on getting the actual bellows put into the cover. Pretty much the same process in the cover now. So we have the backup cork that goes behind the bellows. I've got a bit of sealer around that. We'll throw that in. That's going to help that seal against the cover. And now the bellows, you can see I've got a corresponding bit of sealer on the back and I've soaked the cork in the same type of gear lube that this final is going to have in it. You don't want to put these together dry because, you know, some guys like me will go and put all these things together and then maybe it's six months before you get the undercarriage done, right? If you put these bellows in dry, that cork will stick to the washer and then the first time you go to move it, it rips the cork, damages the seal, and it leaks right from the start. So. That's the reason for that. I'm just rotating the bellows around so right there I can see the notch lined up with the bottom of that hole. So the dirt shield goes on. And then our bolts with the point on the end that will engage with that notch and the seal keeps it from rotating. Now sprocket time. I don't know if you can see, I think we're just barely in frame. I've also applied some grease to the face of that washer, just a little bit more backup to make sure that doesn't run dry and take a set. So speaking of taking the set, if we've done all of our work correctly, the washer and the gasket will remain in place while I set this on. Let's just see. Yep, seems good. I'm running the sprocket nut down right now because we're going to need to compress that bellows quite a ways before the splines on the sprocket even engage with the splines that are on the shaft. And this is just like when I press the bulk gears on. We're going to have to press these sprockets on, but for now, I'm going to just cinch the nut down so that I stick the sprocket onto the splines enough that it keeps the bellows seal and everything fully compressed. So all that sealer, all those seals can take a set, be in their final happy place position. So that when I remove the nut, all this stuff should stay together and then I can move on to actually pressing the sprocket. Now that we've performed all those same steps to the other side, it's time to press sprocket. So I'm using pretty much the same setup as I used to pull bull gears. This adapter that I made that grips the end of the sprocket shaft is going to come in handy, forcing screw. We're doing the 30 ton ram. These sprockets only have to be pressed on to 15. So the 30 is going to be a little bit of overkill, but considering I already had an adapter made that would go right onto there, that's going to be the most convenient setup to use. So 15 tons it is. Five tons. Ten. Fifteen. Thirty five pound ram, five pound adapter, two pound sleeve, three pound forcing screw makes it want to do this. Once again, five, ten, fifteen. All right, I just finished cutting these two cork rings. So just like under the bolts for the steering clutch drums, these will go underneath the nut that retains the sprocket and it stops any oil that might weep up those splines. So one for the right side, 
one for the left. Before I took this adapter off, I wanted to show you guys, if you were paying attention when I installed this before I pressed the sprocket, I ran it up until it was just hand tight against the face of the sprocket. And then we put the 15 tons on there. And you can see if we can get the camera right, we've got a little bit of daylight between there. I bet that moved the sprocket on another 16th of an inch anyway. And that's kind of impressive considering I'd already kind of snug those with like a one inch drive ratchet and it was already tight on the splines and that's just how far we <laughs> stretched it up those splines if you will or up the tapers so pressing them on does does do some good back in the day before i had any of these tools to actually press these back on i would take the approach of actually like working them on meaning i would just tighten the sprocket nut down as tight as i get it with that one inch bar and a cheater pipe then I'd go operate the machine for a while and then I'd recheck those and see if they were loose. Sometimes you get a little bit more turn, operate it for a while. Sometimes you get a little bit more turn. Keep doing that until the nut wouldn't turn anymore. And after I kind of worked them on like that, they seem to have stayed tight. So I'm not recommending you do that. I'm just saying that I have done that and it hasn't gotten me in trouble yet that I know of. Cork ring is in place. Tighten the nut. And to finish up, position the lock and install the bolts. Looking good there, and looking good there. Ladies and gentlemen, we did it. We're done with final drives, done. And also, we're finished with the tapered press fits. We've done every one that there is to do on a D2. Finals are always so nice to be done with because it's heavy work, it's dirty work, it's potentially dangerous work, lots of tonnage, things are really tight, and you know, I'm pretty happy with these. We flipped all the bowls and all the pinions around. Fresh wear surfaces on everything. We got them laid out, pow, pow, on each side, ready to go up to the transmission after we do the test fire on the diesel, of course. Yeah, tell you what, it's just kind of looking more and more like an exploded D2 all the time. So, yeah, and also, I'm kind of excited about these bellows in here. We rehabbed those things. I think they're going to be pretty good. I mean... There's no reason they shouldn't leak like when they were new, right? Uh, it's kind of the nature of the beast with those things, but I'm just happy to have this phase of the project behind us. Undercarriage is coming next, unless I end up making a trip to get starting engine parts for the machine shop, and we're gonna have to regroup. Thinking of other plans there. Again, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I'd like to haul all that stuff home and be able to show you all exactly what's happening with that. So might haul some track frames in here. Maybe tomorrow, I don't know. But for tonight, I need to start putting a video together. I'm just happy to be done with final drives. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, pretty sure I did. But as always, everybody, thanks for watching. Membership's available down below. Early content, ad-free content, extra behind the scenes stuff. If that's something that floats your boat, if not, that is cool too. I'm just happy to be done with final drives. Tune in again, everybody.